Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. With us is an old friend, Frank Wisner, a distinguished diplomat. Frank has served as ambassador to Egypt and India and almost everywhere else. A brilliant career of public service under eight presidents and spanning four decades. Frank will tell us about the major foreign policy challenges facing the new administration in 2017. Frank, we're delighted to have you back with us. Jim, it's a pleasure. Uh, the next president will undoubtedly face uh, major challenges in foreign policy. We live in an increasingly dangerous world. Uh, it may involve partnering with those who uh, have been or may even continue to be our adversaries. Uh, and uh, perhaps we can start with uh, North Korea, uh, which is a terribly troubling situation where they have... Uh, uh, recently uh, had their uh, fifth uh, nuclear test. Uh, and do you see them as accelerating their, uh, their nuclear program? Well, Jim, first of all, let me thank you for my return appearance on this wonderful program, which I watch regularly and profit from. Well, you're too kind. Um, I am uh, delighted to be with you today. And the subjects that you are raising are really important, starting with North Korea. But when I think about our new administration, we are really going to have to focus on getting our own house in order. In other words, a working relationship between the President of the United States and the Congress of the United States. For if we are house divided, we are ineffective or much less effective on the world stage. Now, you raise Korea. I think this is an extraordinarily important moment. And I believe that our, our new administration is going to have to do a serious zero-based analysis of where we've been during the last three administrations, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and decide what are the best steps going forward. For you've just pointed out the key fact, the North Koreans have shown extraordinary capacity to develop the most dangerous nuclear weapons and missile systems to carry them. And they continue to make technological improvements so that we have to look at a North Korea with serious nuclear and missile capability. That said, today and to this point, we have been looking at North Korea as something that we could deal with by turning to China or outsourcing to sanctions. That's not worked. So we're going to have to sit down and think all over how to approach them. Well, it would appear, would it not, that they will develop, if they continue on uh, the present trajectory, a, um, a nuclear weapon and a delivery system that could reach uh, the United States within the term of the uh, 45th president. Well, you know, I'm not going to rule anything in or out. But I think you're right to underscore the gravity of the situation and not dismiss North Korea as a deeply troubled and backward nation, which in general are true facts. But it's also a nation we have to deal with. It is a sovereign entity. And it requires very careful handling because it has a huge army. It has a desperately uncomfortable situation in North Asia. It affects the future of key allies, Korea and Japan, and with its nuclear weapons can be a destabilizing factor on the world stage. All we've done up until now, it would seem, is embark on a strategy of uh, strategic patience, where we sit and watch and they uh, accelerate and they develop and they improve uh, their capabilities. And uh, there have been sanctions uh, there have been uh, at least uh, two attempts to arrive at some treaty with them, but we, 
That hasn't worked, and we haven't even talked to Kim Jong-un uh, since he took office. Well, I'm not going to argue that he's easy to talk to, and he is not. And diplomacy in North Korea is going to be very tough. But we face core choices. Do we want to go to war with North Korea, or do we want to sit around and do nothing? I don't think either of those choices are real ones. Therefore, we have to deal with North Korea. It means we're going to have to negotiate with North Korea. What, therefore, can be negotiated? And in what time frame? And with whom is allies? Now, we do need the full cooperation of China. And so I think a starting point in a new policy is to come to an agreement with China about what goals and objectives to be pursued and when. And certainly not to give up something we in China believe in, and that is that we can't have yet another nuclear power in the world, that in some time in the future, North Korea's nuclear capability has to be brought under control. We're not going to accept a North Korea that's a nuclear state. But do we have to expect that to be tomorrow morning? We know we can't get there with sanctions. They're not going to work uh, in the speed and effectiveness we've seen for many years now. They haven't stopped the North Koreans. So we have to start with a strategy in which they get some things and we get some things. Our South Korean and Japanese allies are brought together with us and they get what they need and come up with a balanced package. That's going to be tough, but that's the third option, neither war nor neglect, but engagement. Well, certainly our Korean allies would like to see a unified peninsula and certainly that would be one of the items uh, on the table in any negotiation. Now, don't you think President Xi of uh, China prefers the status quo to a unified uh, Korea? Well, I think both Koreas pay great lip service to a unified Korea. There isn't any question about that. Uh, but is that a realistic objective in the short to medium term? I'm, I don't think it is. I think rather it's very important to give strategic assurances to South Korea and a reassurances to North Korea that its sovereignty and territorial integrity will be respected and its regime will be dealt with, as uncomfortable as that is, given the record of that regime. But we're going to have to deal with it. So engagement through negotiations, to me, is the only path forward. And that's got to be based on a certain amount of respect an acceptance of the other man's ideas and point of view and try to find a balance that will serve multiple interests. Well, we've certainly made a, um, a record of this because in the Obama administration, we have uh, concluded agreements with uh, three pariah states, uh, Burma and uh, Iran and Cuba. Uh, so would you take the same approach to uh, North Korea? Well, we made uh, a hugely important strategic came to a hugely important strategic understanding with the erstwhile Soviet Union over nuclear arms. Um, we've negotiated the very toughest forms of national security agreements on many occasions in the past. What is to tell us that we cannot negotiate with North Korea? How would you go about doing this? Would you do it with a back channel, secret talks, as we did with Iran, or would you uh, recognize them and, and, and then start talking? Uh, no, I think it starts with a clear signal to China that we want to come to a common position and then bring our allies into that common position, Korea and uh, uh, South Korea and Japan. And at that point, with an agenda of ideas, sit down, listen to the North Koreans, put your requirements on the table and see how the two sets of requirements can overlap and be time phased where they do things, we do things, they do things, we do things. And it ought to have on the table major questions, like a peace treaty to end the Korean War of the 1950s. There is still no peace treaty. So have to go into this with our eyes open, but our minds open as well, willing to, willing to listen and figure out a path forward that deals with the multiplicity of interests of the neighborhood and of the two Koreas. Was it a smart move to uh, deploy the THAAD uh, anti-missile system to South Korea at this time? 
Well, there's plenty of arguments in favor of a robust uh, anti-missile system, particularly given North Korean developments of, of, of missiles. Uh, that said, it is really, really, really angered the Chinese. And if your key, one of your key objectives in a Korea strategy is to reach a common position with China, you need to weigh actions that provoke China as opposed to engage China in a common endeavor, which would be finding a way forward with North Korea. What would you offer China in order to get them uh, to the table in uh, any negotiation with North Korea? Well, I think China has some really key interests. It doesn't want to see North Korea and South Korea in flames. That They also agree with us that a nuclear uh, Korean Peninsula is a really bad idea. So you have some common starting points. We're to build on those and then agree on the tactics and strategic outcomes and then bring in other parties. Our colleagues, the friends, our very important allies, South Korea and Japan, but others in the region. We've dealt with Russia on this subject in the past. Nothing to exclude them. Uh, would you use uh, cyber as uh, Israel did in, uh, and the U.S. did in, in the case of Iran? Uh, would you uh, take out uh, some of their scientists or leaders or have South Korea do it uh, well, as Israel did in, uh, in Iran? Uh, um, or uh, uh, would you pursue these uh, hardline options at the same time that you sought engagement? Well, I think one should be firm. Uh, that does not necessarily mean your first choice of responses to an already very dangerous and difficult situation are violent outcomes. Um, I think I, my preference would be to maintain a strategic firmness, your posture in South Korea, your forces there. Uh, this is all very important to make it clear that we're not backing away, showing any form of weakness, but we are looking for a way forward that serves everyone's interests. And that's where I think I would go rather than believe that the first step is to actually engage in acts of violence. And the one you mentioned would be precisely that. Uh, let's move on to Iran, which is uh, also uh, um, a country where we uh, will face challenges. Uh, we made a deal with them on nuclear. It's not clear whether the deal will hold. Uh, the report of the IAEA uh, has confirmed that they've been in compliance. They've probably been in compliance for at least three years. Um, and uh, so the, the deal seems to have worked, but is there uh, room to engage with Iran on other issues like Syria and, um, uh, and, and other areas of the Middle East? Well, I think there is, but let's back up for a second. The, to my way of thinking, the agreement with Iran was a triumph of American diplomacy. We, and you were we, part of it, so we congratulate you on that. Well, you're very kind. I, I, we always, I was part of a number of people encouraging this to go forward, but the negotiators were very skillful, and John Kerry deserves the credit that he's received for putting together a tough agreement and an agreement that maintained consensus between all members of the Security Council in Germany. But let's pause for a moment. I think you've made just a hugely important point. And that is, by all accounts, our own intelligence systems and the IAEA, which has the most intrusive inspection regime ever established in history for any country, confirms the Iranians are respecting this agreement. The second observation I'd make is that if you think of all of the problems in the Middle East that we face today, and many of them in opposition to Iran, how much worse they would be if in addition to those problems, Iran was on our way to having a nuclear arsenal. Now that's, we're not there. Uh, not there and we're not gonna be there for some time to come. About so 10 the years. first step, well, at a minimum of 10 years, but then, uh, ten years is actually not the end date, and there are obligations under the NPT that follow. So this figure of ten years is, to my way of thinking, a bit overdrawn, but leave that aside. The key point is 
we have time to work on other, other questions, to engage and see where we can take it. The critical question on our side has to be what are our strategic objectives? What kind of Middle East do we want? And I'm going to argue we want to have the United States influencing the range of crises in the Middle East where we have vital interests, but not necessarily in a position where we are intervening militarily as we did in this last decade. We went to war in Afghanistan and Iraq, but using military force in the exception but being able to adjust a balance of power between the contending forces with the United States coming down on the side of stability in every instance that lies before us. Iran is a key player. You've got to deal with Iran. So I believe that, yes, it's possible, but the starting point, we have to make sure the agreement on nuclear works. And today, it's not fully working. We have a battery of sanctions that still exist against Iran and an array of administrative regulations that are cutting off trade in dollars and in commodities that are holding Iran back without a political objective to justify the restraints that are on them. And then we have a range of issues in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, in the Gulf, in Yemen, in Lebanon, all of which Iran is party to. And we have to begin to get to work and address those. And Iran's going to be part of those equations. And Iran's going to be part of coming to an agreement with a balance in the region between the Saudis and Iran. So it's a very busy agenda. Uh, does Iran, in your judgment, want a, uh, a stable Middle East? I, I think that obviously has to be fully tested. There are many instances you can say that this was an ideological regime, but also it's a regime that has Iranian national interests in mind. Iran is in the region. It both needs to protect itself from its point of view and at the same time live in peace with its neighbors. And how to get that balance right is a test of Iranian statesmanship, but it's also a test of our resolve to back friends like Saudi Arabia, like Israel, to ensure that their safety and security are also assured. And then to engage all parties in finding ways through these frightful catastrophes that are plaguing the Middle East. Well, it's been said that there are really two Irans. Uh, they're, they're the moderates, uh, Rouhani and, uh, and Zarif, and there are uh, the, the Republican Guard, the, the hardliners, and uh, with the supreme ruler maybe being the umpire between the two. But does that create uh, a, uh, uh, a structural problem for the United States in, in trying to get Iran to... Uh, uh, engage in, uh, uh, and help us with Syria and Afghanistan? Jim, if I said at the outset of your program that getting our own house in order is a critical function of our underlying assumption of a successful foreign policy, Iran's house is also uh, a house with many rooms in it. There's no doubt about that. But having said that, we don't know Iran very well. We have been out of contact with Iran largely since 1979 when the Shah fell. We don't have the depth of understanding of what goes on inside that regime. And we're very quick to make assumptions without really having those rooted in the depth of experience. So I would say I wouldn't be guided by my assumptions about what's going on in Iran. I'd be guided by American national interests what's good for the United States and important? And where can we find common grounds with Iran? And where do we have to oppose Iran? Our basic strategic posture in the region should be to seek the region's stability, which means ending the chaos of the wars in Syria and Yemen, ending the, 
political uncertainty in Lebanon. Certainly not helped by uh, Russian planes flying from Iranian air bases and, and bombing uh, Aleppo and perhaps the most vicious bombing uh, since World War II of a civilian city. I'm fully in agreement the brutality of what's going on, uh, my dislike of the Assad regime and its use of these instruments of war against an innocent population. But one also has to remember there's a civil war going on and it isn't just going to stop. You have to find a way out of the war. And that means finding enough understanding between the external players to the problem of Syria, Iran, Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, ourselves, for starters, all of whom have interests inside of Syria. So you can bring Syrians together around a package of settlement proposals that would lead their way out of the, out of the trouble. Simply saying, getting rid of one party or another isn't going to end this war. It's going to only be ended when there is a political settlement that assures the essential interests of the comp competitors in the Civil War. Can there be a sensible political settlement without changing the dynamics on the ground? It seems that uh, the regime is winning hands down. They're bombing uh, cities, they're uh, murdering large populations, they're creating a refugee crisis of unparalleled dimension. Well, that, that's also true, but let's remember there's ISIS engaged in equal equally outrageous forms of brutality. There's Jabhat Nusra, the Al-Qaeda uh, clone that's operating with also ugly techniques of war. There's no monopoly on viciousness. Uh, this is a civil war and the stakes are very high. So I think if you just stop there and wring your hands, you won't get anywhere. What you've got to look at is how can you find common ground to marginalize the radicals who are the threat to the United States and get a political understanding between Syrians in opposition and the Syrian government. That more or less is the strategic challenge before you. And you need the cooperation of Russia. You need the cooperation of Iran. You've got to get the Turks and the Saudis on board in order to contain this problem. And are there ways of imagining a Syria future that doesn't involve the current regime, that incorporates elements of the opposition? I think there are. Uh, ways were found through a terrible civil war in Lebanon. Can we accomplish it without engaging uh, with the Iranians? No, I don't believe so. Whether it's explicit or implicit, Iran has a major stake. It is a key funder of the Assad regime, and it provides substantial military support uh, through budget transfers, arms deliveries, strategic, tactical intelligence and advice, and it also encourages and brings to the battlefield uh, Shia from other parts of the region. Uh, Nasrullah's Hezbollah is fighting alongside the regime and others have been have come in encouraged by the Iranians to pick up cudgels and be part of the fight. Zarif said we have to engage with the jihadis. It's the only way that we'll settle the problem. Uh, well, I'm not which, sure. Which jihadis is he talking about? I don't, I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I fully understand that. Uh, I think the point that would strike me as important is that you've got to marginalize the ISIS people and the Al-Qaeda people. They're not going to be part of our future Syria. And uh, I think that's really what he's driving at. But separating particularly the Al-Qaeda forces and the free Syrians is a very big challenge. And well, we are neutralizing Al Qaeda, which is in the middle of the Aleppo battlefield, is is a tough task. We're quickly running out of time, but could you spend just uh, a few seconds on Europe? Is that a challenge for the United States in light of Brexit and uh, the uh, economic deterioration and the, their own problems with right wing extremism? 
Uh, very definitely, Jim. Very important question you've put on the table. And briefly, there are two huge problems. Uh, there is the problem of standing up to Russia and at the same time dealing with Russia and achieving that balance that will guarantee European security and doing that in alliance with or in hand in hand with our European allies. The second is with our European allies, working with them as they themselves overcome their economic difficulties and reassuring them that the United States is a partner who can be relied on. So I look back at the campaign, there were a lot of questions raised about NATO. One of the most important alliances we have that's given us peace throughout my entire lifetime was called into question. And I wasn't the only one to notice that. Europeans noticed it. They need to be reassured the United States is not going to pack its bags and go home and leave them to quarrel among themselves or face Russia without an Atlantic alliance that stood the test of time so far. So no Amerexit. Uh, no Amerexit. Uh, unfortunately, we've come to a close. It's been just marvelous. So Frank Wisner, thank you so much Thanks, for Jim. coming by. This thank you. This was just wonderful. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best and take care.